have the honor of introducing Ian Wiffen, who is going to talk about unidentified forensic objects. I actually recruited Ian to do a talk for the summit because he is brilliant. If you have not met Ian, if you have not used Artex, if you haven't gone out to his site, you're definitely missing out. So Ian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you. I don't know if recruit is the right word. Bullied, I think might be. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, hi everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Um, as Heather said, I'm Ian Whiffin. I'm the senior digital intelligence expert at Cellbrite with the R&D team. Uh, but today, my talk is not going to be Cellbrite related at all. Uh, as we said, we're going to be talking about UFOs. I wish I was talking about real UFOs, but it's going to be just unidentified forensic objects. So what I mean by that is, prior to joining Cellbrite, I was a cop for 17 years, and I spent eight of those years uh, doing digital forensics. And during that time, I uh, decided to create a website, uh, doubleblack.com, to share some of the research that I was doing and the tools that I was writing. Uh, now, the, the, the research that I was doing and the tools I was writing were typically directly related to problems that I was having uh, with real cases that I was working on. And I'm sure that this problem or these problems I was having are familiar to everybody. So a crime gets committed, devices get seized, and then while doing the analysis, you come across an artifact that you can't explain. You've either not seen it before or just don't know how it got there. And this happens a fair amount because Forensic tools are great at surfacing data, at recovering deleted things, but they don't try and explain what that data means and why the artifact's there. And I think that's where examiners really do uh, give value to the case to explain what that data is, what it means and how it got there. But how do you explain an artifact that you've never seen before? How do you know if it's evidential or not? Uh, you can either put it into the report, but if it's, irrelevant, it's just noise that you're creating. And this could potentially cause confusion down the road. Or you can choose to exclude it from the report. But then what if it was something that's evidential? It might mean something to somebody, but not to yourself. So you've got a choice. And typically, it comes down to three options, I think, in these cases. You can either go 50-50, um, put it into the report, or not. And you, either case, you're really hoping that you're never questioned about this artifact again. I mean, it's, it's a terrible choice. It's a terrible approach, but it is an approach that you could take. You could choose to ask the audience. Sorry, I mean, ask the community. You can talk to your colleagues. You can reach out online, talk on forums, read blogs. Uh, chances are somebody has seen this artifact before and may be able to help you. If not, if you still don't know what it's from, then you can get a test device, uh, create some test data, and try and figure out for yourself what that artifact means. And that's more or less what the focus of this talk is gonna be. So th there's several ways you can go about this, but typically they all boil down to the same few steps. Get a test device, create some test data that you think is related to the artifact that you're researching, uh, uh, extract that data, and then pass it in whatever tool you use for passing. Then start manually digging in and try to find uh, evidence that you expect to be there, something similar to the, uh, the artifact you're investigating. Depending how you do this, this could take a long time. The process of creating data, exporting data, passing data and researching it could easily take an hour. And that's what I'm hoping I might be able to help speed up uh, with this talk today. So as I said previously uh, on my website, I have apps that I share. And there's one that I started writing a few years ago. Uh, some of you may have seen called Artifact Examiner or Artex. And when I started to write this, uh, it was designed purely to address specific artifacts within Knowledge C that traditional tools weren't supporting at the time. But as time went on, I started to build more and more into Artex. Uh, it became bigger and bigger and became harder to maintain. So recently I decided to start completely from scratch and rewrite 
for Artex 2, which is available in, uh, in beta 2 form on my website as of about an hour ago. So this is a completely rewritten tool with a brand new interface, uh, but maintains a lot of the original features that Artex 1 had, so timelines and maps. Uh, we now have a location overview, which is more powerful than before. Uh, we still have direct review. And within direct review, you have the ability to, uh, to read files natively, including SQLite, blobs, etc. But I'll come back to that shortly. The reason I've continued to maintain uh, this app, despite working for Celeb right now, uh, is I find it's a great tool for validation and research. I don't know why that end dropped off the end, but never mind. It will read archives, uh, folders, single files, or devices. And this is the one that I think has the most value uh, for people wanting to do research. So we can take uh, a phone that's jailbroken, installed with SSH, and a computer running Artex, and we can connect to the, uh, the phone via either Wi-Fi or an SSH tunnel. And at that point, Artex will treat the live device like an extraction. That means that we can view data directly, pass data directly, without having to do a full extraction. This takes minutes rather than hours. So we can read the data, graph it out, see the artifacts live, make changes on the device, and then quickly re-pull the same data and see how the, the, uh, the interaction with the device had an effect on the data. Here, for example, we can see how the application focus changed, media started to play, and the orientation of the device changed. Uh, and there's a lot of parsers that are currently supported. Uh, that I've been working on over the last few months. And this, this new model of Artex 2 allows for much easier and faster uh, adding of parsers as, as time goes on. But for this tool to be really useful from a, a research point of view, it needs to do more than just handle uh, applications that somebody, myself usually, has researched and, and made a parser for. And that's why I've included uh, the direct reviewer that you can just go through, navigate, search, export from, and view data live, uh, pulls from the device each time you, you open it. Uh, and again, that includes viewing blob plist or protobuf data in a, a custom plist slash protobuf viewer uh, that I've built. So how do we actually go about using this? Uh, so we get a jailbroken phone. At the moment, we only support iOS, uh, and Artex will not perform the jailbreak for you. So we get the jailbroken phone, we use Cydia to install OpenSSH, and then you connect it to the computer. Oops, jump back a slide. Either uh, via a tool such as 3U tools and create an SSH tunnel, or connect via an IP address. Connecting via IP address is going to be a little bit slower, but it should work fine. Then we're going to open up Artex and select begin. And that's going to open up the extraction finder where we can choose to, uh, to load an archive, the art extraction, which is the live connection, uh, a folder or file. So we're going to choose art extraction. And mm -hmm. then from there, you'll see it uh, auto populates the IP address, the port, the username and password. If you're happy with all that, we're going to hit test connection. And assuming the connection is good, we're going to go green and this panel will become live. Now this will allow you to connect live to the device or to do an extraction uh, to a tar file. But we'll hit live connection. And at that point, Artex is gonna to talk to the phone, it's gonna get the full directory structure or files, folders, etc., And it's gonna look down the list of files and decide which parsers uh, will work on this device. It'll then start to pull some of the basic information from the phone. And when it finishes, typically takes a minute or two, you're going to see a device summary page, which includes the Apple ID, the phone number, uh, the last wipe time, that kind of important data. And we can go through and look at the contacts and we can look at the timeline and the available passes. We can run some of these passes if we want. Uh, and of course, it only downloads the data for the passes you've selected. This makes it pretty fast. 
and we can get from nothing to do to this kind of view within 20, 30 seconds. Uh, likewise, we can look at the locations and use this to filter based on location type. So we can remove uh, location types we don't think are very valuable. And we can also filter by uh, accuracy. So if we only want to see the records that are better than 100 meters in terms of accuracy, we can easily do that. Uh, and again, we can look at the directory structure. So how is this useful when doing research? I've already kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, but what we can do is use the timeline, um, set a from and to time of right now effectively, the time that we're interested in working on the phone, choose from the available passes, in this case, orientation, and hit run. That's gonna to go to the phone, download the databases and plot out all of the orientation artifacts that occur within the time span I've selected. And we can see there are none. At this point, I can choose to rotate the phone, rotate it back and hit the run button again. And again, we see there are no records. Nothing has been recorded for orientation during that activity. So as a researcher, I start thinking, okay, maybe it's because I need an application open uh, to test this. So I'll choose Safari. And obviously when I now rotate the phone with Safari on screen, it changes from portrait to landscape and it can change back again once I uh, move the phone back. Again, I hit the run button and now we can see we have orientation information along with the, uh, the Safari history. So again, I might, might now question, does the application need to, uh, to be changed by the orientation for a record to be made? So I can start up another application. In this case, I chose timer. And when we move this one and move it back, uh, changing the orientation, nothing changes on the phone. So within you know, a minute or two from starting this research, I've already come to the conclusion that the on-screen application must be affected by the orientation for a record to be made. This could have taken easily an hour if I had to do this by extracting the phone, passing the phone, uh, and then repeating it all over again for the different tests. And this is pretty much where I always start uh, my research. And, and over the last few months, uh, sorry, I, I've jumped ahead of myself here. I'm just gonna go back a moment and just say, what about applications that don't have uh, a parser that supports them? So in this case, this is where the, uh, the database viewer comes in helpful. So here I'm looking at the Arroyo database so Snapchat, uh, and we'll have to pretend that Snapchat's not supported because it actually is in our text. But either way, I can view the database, I can view the conversation message table and see there are 25 records. So 25 messages here. I send a, uh, a message to my test phone and then hit the little reload button in the top right corner. And all that's gonna do is go to the phone and ask for the latest copy of that database and the associated WAL file. That will then load immediately and show the same table that I was already viewing. And we can see that we now have a record 26. So that is the message that's just been sent to this device. And again, it took seconds to get to this data. And that would be a great starting point uh, to go off and, and look more into researching Snapchat, for example. So as I said, I've been using this as a starting point for my research for a while, even while writing our text too, I've been using this. Uh, and I'd like to just share a few examples over the last few months where it's coming useful to give you an idea of how it can be used in the real world. So we had a case where we were asked about the lock screen scroll artifact of Knowledge C. Pretty rare one to actually see, but did exist and we didn't know what it meant. Obviously, it's to do with the lock screen. Obviously, it's to do with a scroll, but we didn't know what type of scroll. And simply viewing the database and scrolling up, down, left, right, we pretty quickly found out that this is an artifact created when you scroll left or right on a locked device. And there could be additional artifacts underneath this that would show additional activity. For example, in this case, you'd see the lock screen scroll and then we would see uh, the camera uh, start to be used. I was also asked about uh, 
the media now playing artifact, again, from knowledge C. Uh, in particular, we were interested in the now playing metadata key playing value, uh, which could be anything from zero to four, according to the device that was being investigated. But again, it was pretty quick to just go and open the database, view the data, make some activity on the phone. So load new videos, pause them, play them, interrupt them. And we quickly found out what each of these values meant. And this was important because in the case, we wanted to know whether media was playing at the time of an incident or not. Uh, just last week, I think it was, there was a question on, on one of the forums about Snapchat system media folder and whether the files that were in this folder were saved by the user or simply cached. So again, I was able to quickly connect to a test device, navigate to that folder and see that I had two videos in that folder. I sent two videos to my test device. One was a standard snap message uh, that is gonna self delete once it's been viewed. And one was a, a video from the photo gallery on my phone. Using Artex and the little remap button in the top here, it just goes to the phone, gets the latest directory structure and then displays that. And I could see that just one extra video had been created. So which video was it? Was it the snap or was it the, uh, the one from the gallery? Bearing in mind, I've not saved either of these uh, videos. They were just received. So I can select the video and play it within our text and see that it's actually the, uh, the video that I sent from the gallery, not the snap. So it appears that persistent media simply means it's not media which is self-deleting. It doesn't need to be uh, saved by the user in order for it to save. Now, before I explain the next uh, live case, or well, real case, I just need to go back a few slides and explain uh, something I said earlier. Because I mentioned that we can read data from device and we can read data from archives, but we can also read data from folders and files. And this comes in useful uh, because it allows you to take a single file, for, for example, cache.sqlite, and plot it and, and, and pass it as if it's a full device. And you'll see that here, we just have the parsers that are supported for cache SQLite. So just cache locations, frequent locations, and vehicle locations. And all this data is also going to be plotted on the, uh, the locations tab as well. Or I might have the entire routine D folder, which contains several location databases, all containing more or less the same kind of data, uh, just different records. So I can point Artex at the folder and it will pass the same data. The same passes will be supported, but will now be including data from the various databases. Uh, or another option, I may have a folder that's got a bunch of random files in it. So we might still have the cache SQLite folder, we might have Arroyo, and we might have photos. In that case, when I point it at the folder, it's going to give me all the, uh, the parsers that are supported with these files. So again, we'll see the location data from the cache. We'll see we have now media locations, which pulls from photos along with photos and Snapchat, and we can plot all that out in the timeline uh, and easily see what was going on without having to pass a full device or other live device. So now I've explained why yeah, or how we can read folders and files, I can explain the idea of timed extractions. And this was something that I came up with a while ago when I was researching some location data. And what I wanted to do was connect my laptop to my phone uh, and take it all for a drive. And I, I wanted to extract data from the phone every few minutes uh, so I could see at what point during my drive the databases were changing and what was happening to them. Uh, but I didn't want to uh, park every few minutes to do the extraction. And obviously I didn't want to try and use the laptop while driving uh, for obvious reasons. So I came up with this idea of timed extractions, which allows you to select files that you're interested in, uh, set a timer, and then every two, three, five minutes, those files you've selected will extract automatically and get saved to a timestamped folder. So once I arrive back home, 
I point it to the parent folder and it reads every subsequent uh, database that, that's been extracted over that time. And doing that, I was able to find an interesting artifact in a consolidated database, which you may know is uh, geofences. And it appears that when the phone is in a frequent location, there's a geofence created called uh, real-time high confidence exit fence for current visit. That's a, an accuracy of 250 meters. And once I break that fence, that record is deleted and it's replaced with a, a new geofence called real-time high confidence entry fence for next predicted location of interest. And that's a really important name to, to break out and realize next predicted location. Because there is a latitude and longitude associated with this record that's going to be found in many tools or in carving, etc. But this is not a location that the device was at. This is not a location that the, the device was necessarily heading to. It's just a location that the device thinks you may be headed to. Uh, so we need to know the difference there. Now, once the device actually arrives at another frequent location, regardless of whether it's the predicted location or not, the next predicted fence will be deleted and be replaced again with the exit fence. And this is actually come in quite useful a few times recently. Uh, bad guys who seem to think that by disabling Wi-Fi on the phone, they're preventing tracking, which is true, but it also means that the exit fence never fires. So if they turn the tracking off while they're in the crime scene area, then that record will stay there forever until they return and, and leave again with tracking turned on. Uh, and then for the final example, uh, I realize that there's quite a few examples here. I don't want to bore you too much with them, uh, but I, I decided to research Getter, the new social media app. Uh, so I created an account, created my first post and connected the phone to Artex and simply did a search for Getter. That's going to give me every file that has Getter as part of the uh, file path or, or file name. Uh, and I could just go down this list and, and open these up, or I can follow a link and jump to the actual folder so I can see uh, the entire application structure, navigate it and find files that I'm interested in that way. And we decided to pick on cache.db, which sounds like it could be interesting. And quite quickly, I saw my first post was listed there. Open that up and start to see uh, the actual post that was made, the username that posted it, and the time and date that it was posted. And that, again, would be a good, time, good place to start investigating that application. Uh, so I've already mentioned I, I love location data and researching location data. Uh, such an important artifact, but so easy to misunderstand the data that's there. And recently I wrote a blog post about uh, the Wi-Fi networks that are listed in cache encrypted B uh, and why I, I don't consider that to be a particularly good source of location data. And I just thought I'd show you how I used Artex to draw that conclusion. So connecting my phone, uh, it mapped out all data on the device for, for a week period. Uh, now this includes uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi locations, the visited locations, cell towers, uh, geofences, frequent locations, everything pretty much. But I can use Artex and filter away all of the location types I don't care about. And just here I'm left with the red markers, which are uh, from cache location B, uh, sorry, cache encrypted B, and the blue markers, which are from three bars. So both Wi-Fi networks. And I can view these on the timeline to see when these locations were downloaded. Now, despite there being over 3,000 records here, there's only a handful of times that these records were downloaded. And that's because each time uh, a download happened, there were hundreds of records downloaded. So how accurate are they? So I can pick on the single three bars record here uh, and see that during this one download event, all of these clusters were downloaded. So how would I know 
where the device actually was. This is like a three or four kilometer range between the furthest two uh, records. And when we look at cache encrypted B, it's even more of a mess. So I'm gonna focus just on two particular clusters, uh, which were downloaded over the course of three uh, download events. At 12.23.21, records were downloaded at both these locations. Again, these are like two kilometers apart. 12.23.39, again, downloads in both of these locations. And at 12.24.29, downloads at this single location. So again, if I'm trying to use uh, this data, these locations to say where a device was, where was it? At 12.23, where was the device? It could be anywhere in between these two. Luckily, because this is a test device, uh, I know the data there, and I already know that there's the cache location data, which is pretty accurate. So if you can just about see the, the gold colored dots, these are the cache location files, which are much better. And I can use the cache location and the, uh, the Wi-Fi location data and draw a line between them to say that these locations were downloaded when the device was at this location. So I can see all these down here are inaccurate. I may have been there at some point. I may have been there just before, uh, or it could have been a prediction event. Either way, I can't say for sure when the device was at this location. Uh, so I've got a few minutes left, I believe. Thought I'd just quickly go over uh, some of the other features that I hope will, will help with your research, uh, make things a little bit easier, such as table layout. If we're viewing a SQL database, we can quickly get the table layout. So all tables, all, file, uh, all fields, and all data types. Uh, we can go into the databases and view the data with or without the while data. And we can also do a comparison uh, of with and without while. Uh, we've got various timestamps supported. Uh, you can write, uh, write customized SQL queries or quickly do find like values by just right clicking on a value and saying, find everything like this. And as I mentioned earlier, we can view uh, plist or protobuf data natively within the, uh, the SQL viewer. What I've not mentioned earlier is the embedded plist or uh, protobuf data. So if there's a, a plist within a plist or plist within a protobuf, et cetera, it's gonna be displayed uh, just as part of the tree. So looking more at that, we can see uh, the custom uh, plist and protobuf viewer. You can click on all these nodes to expand them and see what you want. We can view it in the XML view. And if there is uh, an image, an encoded image within the, uh, the XML view, we can also see that natively too. More generally, just to help, we've got the, uh, the timeline view, as I've already shown a few times, where we can see how artifacts interact with each other. So you'll see that when you turn the device on and unlock it, there's a, a backlight event followed by an unlock event, followed by an application usage event kind of thing. Uh, and we can create static maps. So small 200 by 200 pixel maps that are images. These aren't gonna change between now and if the case goes to court, you'll have it fully documented. Uh, no worry of you know, needing an internet connection in court or the road layouts changed, etc. cetera. Uh, we still have the location view. Uh, so we can use that to, to home in on the data that we think is useful by removing inaccurate or unreliable data and focus on just the, the data that we want. We can also add customized markers to this map. So I can add the bad guy's house, the scene of the crime, the, uh, the vehicle dump location, and they're gonna stay wherever you put them on the map when you scroll around uh, and start looking around everywhere. Uh, we can view messages from various different uh, communication applications as part of a timeline or as part of a conversational view. And of course, all of this can be output to a HTML report, uh, including all graphs and 
uh, maps. So to summarize, our text can read archived information, uh, folders, files, or from live devices. Uh, it will only pull the data that it's investigating. So if you only want SMS data, it's only gonna pull the SMS databases. This makes it much faster to research stuff. It's got built-in parsers, but it's also got the ability to go into the back end and view the data manually. And finally, this is not a tool that's going to replace anything that you currently use. That's not the intention, but it, I'm hoping that it is a tool you'll find useful to add to your toolbox. Uh, and for the price, can't really complain. So that, that's all I have. Uh, again, thank you for, for joining me. Uh, it is available to download from my, uh, my website now for free. I'd love to hear any feedback you've got, comments, complaints, suggestions, uh, anything like that. It is a work in progress still. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That is wonderful. Um, lots of praise to you in your channel, obviously. People are really excited. And honestly, if you have not tried Artex yet, you really should. And Ian's super, super responsive if there's ever any issues. Um, he even got on a Zoom with Lee and I to walk through it in prep for putting it into 585. So thank you, Ian, seriously, for all your research, all that you do, all of these things. Most of you know that if you've been emailing me lately on location artifacts, I forward you directly to the location master, Ian himself, because you know way more than I'm even going to pretend to. I've spent an unhealthy amount of time working on location data. <laughs> on tracking people. You yeah. know, if you ever go missing, you want Ian to find you. <laughs> I should be find friends with you, Ian, actually, so you could always find me if something occurs. There you go, yeah. But seriously, thank you. This was brilliant. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ian, go ahead and put them in the hallway. I'm sure he will pop in and take a look. And yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you.